1 Kings chapter number 19, and I'd like to read the first eight verses of the chapter. When you found your place, say amen. amen. 1 Kings 19 and chapter, uh, verse number 1, the Bible said, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, uh, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water in his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again, proving, praise God, that there's nothing that a good meal and a nap won't take care of. Praise God. Say amen right there. I believe the 11th commandment is thou shalt take a nap on Sunday afternoon. That's right. I believe that's Bible tonight. Verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. And I want you to notice the last part of the verse, Because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. I'd like to use the last part of verse 7, but don't close your Bible because we're going to preach down through the text here tonight. But I'd like to use verse 7 where it said, The journey is too great for thee. I'd like to preach to your heart this evening on the subject, Joy for the journey. Joy for the journey. Y'all, I, I believe we are living in a time uh, nearing the coming of the Lord Jesus. I believe everybody in here would admit when you look around at what's going on in our society, as it relates to Scripture, we are living in the days of Lot. We are living in the days of Noah. Paul said it would be circumstances like nighttime before the Lord come. We're living in dark days, perilous times, wicked times. We, we understand this. It was already told it's going to be this way. It should not shock us or surprise us. What is discouraging at certain points in the day which we live, Brother Foster, is it seems like many of God's people in these days have lost all the joy in their journey. They've lost all the joy of serving God. They've lost all the joy in worshiping the Lord. They've lost all the joy out of their walk with God, and it just ought not to be so tonight. Can I pause and say the happiest people and the most joyful people and the people that's got the most hope in this world should be God's people tonight. There ought not to be one person outside the four walls of this building that's got any more joy or any more hope or any more peace or any more anything to shout about tonight than you and I that have been redeemed by the grace of God going to the land that the preacher just sang about a minute ago. We got something to worship, shout, and have joy about tonight. I'll be honest with you, friend. I don't, I don't preach a lot of camp meetings anymore, uh, but I still go one or two in the year. And I'll be honest with you, it, it bothers me to watch many preachers, even even in, in our circle, our movement, seem like they ain't got no joy, Brother Doug. I mean, they upset and they mad and they ticked off. Let me say this. He's been many times when I've been weary in the way, but I am not weary of the way tonight. He's been many times I've been a sorry Christian, but I am not sorry that I am a Christian tonight. I thank God for a mom and daddy that raised me around the things of God. I thank God for a mom and daddy that raised me around the book and the blood and the blessed hope. I thank God for some preachers that preach some standards into my life. And I'm not mad about it. I'm not bitter about it. I'm not trying to recover from it. I am enjoying my journey and having a time on my way to heaven this evening. 
I do not know what the next three or four years might hold. Y'all listen to me. I'm not trying to be doom and gloom here for a minute. I'm preaching on joy for the journey. But let me just say this real fast. If Jesus don't come back next two or three years and something really radical doesn't change in administration in four years, you and I will not recognize the America that we're going to be living in. The policies that are being implemented, the godless wicked heathens that are at the steering wheel driving this country, brother, we will not recognize this thing after about three or four years. She's going down in a hurry. We realize it's got to be that way for the Lord to come back. But may I say this, I don't know what's going to go on in the White House. I don't know what's going to go on with the lawmakers, but I know what can go on in my heart tonight and I can still have joy in the journey regardless of who's in the White House, regardless of who's running the Senate or the Congress. I know who sits on the throne. I know who's running the show in heaven and you and I can have joy in the journey. Here in the Bible we are looking at one of the great men of the Word of God. I don't say that lightly tonight. When I say he's one of the great men of the Word of God, he is this evening. He's a key central figure from 1 Kings chapter number 17 all the way to the book of the Revelation. I, I mean, this guy right here, he, he's not just... Uh, how can I say this without sounding bad? He's not just your average run-of-the-mill common Christian this evening. I mean, this guy right here, he prays, and when he prays, God listens. You say, well, God listens to me too. Yeah, but when this guy prays, God shuts the heavens up for three and a half years, and it don't even rain or dew on the land. When this guy prays after three and a half years, God opens the heavens up and it starts raining again. This guy raises people from the dead. This guy right here, when it come time for him to leave this world and go to the next, he didn't just die off and get buried like normal people. No, God sent the royal limousine down for this fella. And just one day while he's walking along, whoo, here come the royal limo, picked him up, and out of the sight of Elisha, Elijah went to heaven in a whirlwind and a chariot of fire. This guy's such a man of God that when Jesus and John the Baptist come preaching, they confused the both of them for this guy right here. They said, that must be Elijah. Hey, some about this guy that they thought Jesus and John the Baptist reminded them of this guy. This guy right here is the one that when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and, and he's standing there and he transfigures and the God on the inside pops loose on the outside. This is one of the fellows that shows up with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's one of the last two individuals mentioned in Malachi chapter 4 before you drop off in the New Testament. He's one of the two witnesses that's going to come and preach and prophesy in the book of the Revelation to the Antichrist before he loses his head and then gets raptured out again. This guy is something tonight. What helps my heart is this, that even though Brother Jordan, this guy has all those credentials, he has all of that backing, he has all of that power of God, it does not exempt him from getting to a place where he just gets war slap out. He gets to a place in his life where he just says, It's enough! I have had all I can stand! I'm through. I'm done. Let me stop right there and say, you may be sitting here tonight, child of God, and sit there and you say, I, I'm just done. I'm fed up with it. I've had all I can take. You are in good company tonight. Elijah got there in his life as well. Here in the text, we find Elijah's emotions is just going crazy. Elijah's emotions is having a heyday with him. And let me say this, you better be careful and keep your emotions in check. It's real easy to get to the place where you walk by feelings and not by faith tonight. And if you walk by how you feel and you walk by how things are looking in your life, you're going to wind up under a juniper tree saying enough is enough as well. If you're constantly walking by what you can see and not what you can't see, and walking by what you do feel instead of what the Word of God says you're going to wind up a discouraged depressed Christian wanting God just to end it all and put you on the shelf somewhere this evening here we find that this fellow he feels faint in the text the Bible said he felt faint the Bible says that he sat down he lay down he slept in the text he just wore out 
He's tired of the ministry. He's tired of people. He's tired of everybody out to get him. I mean, here he does this great miracle on Mount Carmel, and instead of everybody patting him on the back and saying, God bless you, we appreciate the rain. They've had none for three and a half years. That's wonderful. Instead, that wild Hitler from hell named Jezebel says, look here, let me tell you something, Jack. We're going to kill you and make you just like the rest of them prophets you killed. You better get out of town, cowboy, Well, by the time the sun sets, because it's over for you. He's just fed up and tired with all of it this evening. I don't know about you, but our times in life, you can get to the place where you just get tired. I, I mean, you, you're tired of living right and doing right and serving God while everybody else around you ain't living right and ain't doing right and ain't serving God. We've all been there from time to time. Here we find he felt faint. He doesn't just feel faint. He feels like a failure. Did you notice what he said in verse number 4? His request to God in verse 4 is that he might die. He said, Lord, let me just die. It's enough. I, I take away my life. I'm not better than my father's. Well, you kind of are. you really done some things they ain't done. I mean, you know, he gets to the place where he feels like his life's just a big fat zero, like a failure. Listen to me. There are times the devil will come by and tell you you are a failure as a parent, you are a failure as a Christian, you are a failure as a child of God, and sometimes nothing could be further from the truth. Do y'all realize his feeling of failure is not rooted in the truth? He's not a failure. Did y'all read chapter 18? He ain't no failure. Man, this cat prays and the fire comes down. This cat prays and the cloud comes up, busts the rain out. He ain't no failure. But the devil has come by in a moment of weakness and said, you, sir, are a failure in the ministry. Y'all, there are times when you will feel like something that you actually are not this evening. The devil will come by and say, Hey, you're a failure as a mama. You're a failure as a daddy. When nothing really could be further from the truth. When you prayed for them and loved them and took them to the house of God and did everything you could do and the devil make you feel like a failure in your kid's life. The devil make you feel like a failure in your walk with God because you didn't do X and Y and Z this evening and you can get to the place where Elijah got to where you feel like a failure is everything in your life feels failure like a failure he felt faint he, he felt forsaken down in verse number 10 and verse number 14 he says the exact same thing two times to the Lord watch what he said in verse number 10 he said I've been very jealous for the Lord of hosts Lord God of hosts the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thine altars slain thy prophets with the sword <laughs> he feels forsaken and I even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away Rude despair and agony on me. Oh, if it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. I mean, here he, oh, Elijah gets the place. He said, I'm the last one left. Honestly, you're not. The Lord come along and said, I, I, I've reserved uh, several thousand here that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You, you may feel like you're the Lone Ranger, but you are not this evening. You're not alone. Somebody loves God. Somebody's praying for you. Somebody's thankful for you. Somebody appreciates you. Somebody loves you. Somebody cares about you. And mark this down. There's a God that does whether you think anybody else does or not this evening. But Elijah's going to get something in the text. He's thinking to get some joy for the journey in the text that's going to take him all the way to the chariot ride. After this text right here, Brother Daniel, we never going to find Elijah with his lip pooched out, dragging the ground again. I believe there's some things that God puts in his heart that God can put in our heart tonight as well that can get us all the way to the chariot ride to the house. I believe there's some joy for the journey to be had in these precious verses of Scripture where even if you feel like a failure tonight, even if you wore slap out tonight and you walked in tonight saying it's enough I've had it up to here I believe there's a God that can refresh there's a God that can revive there's a God that can restore there's a God that can get you back where you was before there's a God that can give joy for the journey this evening say what did you find in the text preacher that can give us some joy for the journey going to show you several things real quick and we'll be done number one I believe the first thing that can give you joy for the journey and what gave Elijah joy for the journey is he found out that he had a course 
that was mapped out. There was a course that was already <laughs> mapped out. Say, what do you mean there's a course that's mapped out? Look at our text. Look at verse 7 down here where I drew you to. To begin with, this angel of the Lord. And I don't know what you believe about the angel of the Lord. I pretty much, I'm sure, know what you believe about it because you've got a Bible-believing pastor tonight. But that angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ of the New Testament. I mean, brother, this is Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, look here in the flesh before we ever got in the flesh, appearing uh, to Elijah, giving him something from heaven tonight. Watch what the angel of the Lord does. Came again the second time, touched him and said, Arise and eat. Now watch the course that's mapped out. Watch it, watch it. Because, notice the next two words, the journey is too great for thee. The journey? The journey? Elijah ain't on no journey as far as a real path that he's going. He just ambles off into the wilderness headed somewhere. He ain't got no real aim. He ain't got no real direction. He just took off into the woods and just says, I'm just going to get away from all of it. I'm just walking around out here. Ain't really got no aim or direction. Nobody cares about me. I'm a failure and a flop in the ministry. And I'm just walking around out here. And God shows up and says, uh, I'm going to let you know I got you on a journey. I'm going to let you know you may, you may think you're just walking around out here and there ain't nothing going on and this is all by chance and by accident. But I'll let you know something, Elijah. I've got the course already mapped out. I got a journey set before you. I've already got it drawn out on the Rand McNally. I've already got it set up. I know the way that you take, and when I've tried you, you're gonna come forth as gold. There's a journey I've got set before you. I already know the end from the beginning. And even though you may think I'm a million, you could God Almighty, you may think I'm a million miles away and don't know where you are and don't know what you're going through, but little do you know I'm the God that sits on high and looks down low and I've got the whole thing mapped out I tell you what tonight look at here it wasn't a chance journey that he was on he was on the GPS he was on the God positioning system tonight there wasn't a time he turned left that God wasn't guiding there wasn't a time he turned right that God wasn't leading there was a map there was a course that was already said and child of God you might have walked up in here tonight and you say my world has totally been flipped upside down I'm just ambling around in the wilderness of this world. I don't know what's going on. I don't know where I'm headed, but you can mark this down. There's a sovereign holy God in the glory world that he's not leaving it up to chance. He's not leaving it up to by the wayside. He's got a goal. He's got a plan. He's got a aim. And you mark this down. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're going through. And the course is mapped out tonight. Oh, yeah. I, I, I like the story I heard one time years ago. They said this little family in, in the 1800s, somewhere along there, early 1900s, had booked passage on a cargo ship heading up this river to go up, up upstream to go where they were headed. And as they got on board that boat that early morning, that early morning fog had settled down in the basin of that river. It was so thick that as the boat was heading on its course up river they could not even see the bow of the boat from where they stood the fog was so thick on the deck of that ship the ship didn't slow down the ship didn't stop the ship didn't say well we're going to wait for another time the captain said we'll we'll go upstream another time no they just kept right on moving matter of fact they accelerated and went upstream that mama got nervous and started telling that daddy, you need to go tell that captain he needs to slow down. He's going to run us into something. He could run us into the shore. He could run us into another boat, kill us and the babies and leave us out here in the water. You need to go tell him to slow down. That husband did like any good husband does and obeys. He walked to the first mate of the ship and looked at the first mate of the ship and he said, sir, we're all scared to death down here on the deck. You need to go tell the captain that he needs to slow down. He might run us into something and kill all of us. We can't see nothing. We can't even see the front of the ship. Can't even see the bow because the fog is so thick. He said, sir, don't you worry about it. The captain's got it all under control. He said, under control? We can't even see where we're going. How's he got everything under control? He said, sir, what you don't realize is the captain is not sitting in the control room on the deck where you and I stand right now. But the control room is several stories high. It's several stories above the 
deck of this ship and where you and I are we can't see anything but mark this down where the, ca where the captain is sitting up there in the control room he sees over the fog he can see past the fog he can see the river and the course of the river and he can see even though you can't child of God you can rest easy tonight you can pillar your head down this evening knowing that we have a God the captain's in the control room and even though you can't see and don't know what's going on he's looking over the fog he sees the bends in the river and he's got the way mapped out and he's going to drive the ship safely all the way to dock in port this evening you have joy in the journey knowing the course is mapped out tonight yeah, it's mapped out for the child of God. You say, how much is this course mapped out? Well, if you're a child of God, the Bible said it's mapped out this much. That once you get saved, after you get saved. I said, after you get saved, He predestinated you to be conformed to the image of His dear Son. That predestination happened after you got saved. You know what God said after you got in Christ? When you got in Christ, He said, I'm going to take you all the way home. Philippians 1 6 said being confident of this very thing what's Paul confident of that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it will perform it will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose for whom he called then he also justified whom he justified then he also glorified brother he's got the course mapped out for the child of God tonight you say I ain't saved tonight then you ain't got much of a course mapped out I tell you when you get the plan mapped out when you get in him boy when you get in him you realize man I, got, I come into something boy I come into something this evening I got a course that's mapped out joy for the journey there was a course that's mapped out can I say secondly this will help you this evening how can we have joy for the journey he not only had a course that was mapped out but secondly he had the comfort of a heavenly meal he got the comfort of a heavenly meal. Look at verse number 5. Watch what your Bible said, verse 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. He looked, behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, cruise of water at his head. He did eat and drink, laid him down again. The angel of the Lord came the second time, touched him, and said, Arise and eat. You say, Preacher, why do you say this is a heavenly meal? Because I figure if an angel's cooking it, it didn't come from this world. Does that make any sense to anybody but me? I figure if there's an angel cooking it, it didn't come from here, it come from yonder. He's fixing to eat supernatural food this evening. The food he's about to eat, it ain't natural food, it's supernatural food. How do you know this is supernatural heavenly meat preacher because verse 8 said he arose eat and drink and when the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights how many meals you ever ate on earth that ever took you for 40 days and 40 nights without needing to eat again how many times you ever ate a steak ribeye grilled chicken big mac from mcdonald's how many times you ever ate a meal that you said after that i don't believe i gotta eat for 40 days and 40 nights no, I don't care. I, I ain't never ate a meal so good in my life that I didn't want to eat again tomorrow. Never. Man, I'll tell you what, I tanked up on some enchiladas at Chewy's today, but you mark this down. Mark this down. Around 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night while I'm hiding out, riding on down through Tennessee and down that way heading to North Carolina, my stomach's going to rumble. I need something to eat. But Elijah got something in the text. He got a heavenly meal that comforted him to the point that it was able to sustain him for the journey. I'm going to tell you how to have joy for the journey. There's only one way to survive and enjoy your journey with God, and it's to eat on heaven's groceries on a regular basis. Y'all hear me this evening? You can't survive. You can't survive on this journey without getting some groceries. 
groceries from the glory world this evening. Say, what do you mean groceries from the glory world? I mean God's give us some groceries in the Word of God uh, that'll keep us up in our tank and help us keep going another mile. Y'all listen to me. I don't know what you know and believe about that book right there, but I'm telling you that Bible said that that book uh, is bread. Man should not live by bread alone by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God's man live. That book's bread. That book's water. That book's milk. That book's meat. That book's honey. That book's apples of gold and pictures of silver. That book's everything you need for spiritual sustenance uh, and spiritual refreshment. You want to know why we got so many Christians ain't got no joy in their journey? Because they ain't been eaten uh, at the table of God. You want to keep joy in your journey? Then you keep on stoking your tank. Not with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Fox News and MSNBC and CNN. I'll tell you how to keep your, your tank stoked up. Put the Word of God in. Put the Word of God in. It'll keep you joy in the journey. Brother, I'm telling you what, I believe with all my heart, I wanna, th th this business that happened with all this coronavirus stuff and all that, y'all look here, I have no idea. I have no idea if Facebook, if knock that over, praise God. I have no idea if Facebook has ever made the lame to walk or the deaf to hear or the blind to see. But it is beyond proven fact that Facebook has made the dumb to speak. promise you that. Preacher Goodson, when all this coronavirus stuff broke out and everybody, you know, tried to justify the fact that they wasn't ever going back to the house of God hardly ever again, they started saying some of the most ignorant stuff I've ever heard in my life. One of the most ignorant statements that ever was made on Facebook, you know, they had pretty little memes when they do it and all that. You know, a pretty meme kind of makes anybody think that what you said is the truth. <laughs> I don't mean it's true, it's going to look good. And they said things like this. They said... I don't have to go to church to be the church. I am the church. Well, that sounds good. Hey, just one problem with that. It ain't Bible. You say, what do you mean it ain't Bible? There ain't no such thing in that book as a church of one. There ain't no such animal as a church of one this evening. Do you know what the word church... These people don't even know what the word church means. you know what the word church means? The word church means a called out assembly. Yeah. I am no doctor or rocket scientist, but I got this much figured out. We ain't an assembly less than we assemble. Right. In person. Right. We ain't a congregation less than we congregate. You, you hear me, hear me well. Brother, look here. That New Testament, that New Testament, that book of Acts is totally written about the starting of local New Testament Bible-believing churches. That, that Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians are all written to local New Testament Bible-believing churches. 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus are written to pastors of New Testament Bible-believing local churches. Philemon is written to a member of a local New Testament Bible-believing Baptist church. The book of Revelation is written to seven local Bible-believing New Testament churches. You know what that tells me? The church is important. You can't survive without it. It's what the New Testament is about. Purchase the church, I told you last night, with his own blood. You know what the most important thing to God is? The most important institution to God on planet Earth in 2021 is the church. Now, I, I ain't trying to be conspiracy theorist with you. I'm trying to get real with you here for just a minute. Let me ask you a real serious question. If the most important thing to your spiritual sustenance and the most important thing to God as far as institutional-wise on planet Earth is the church... Don't you think the devil would try and do something to try and keep you from being there? I mean, I mean, I'm not trying to get way out there on you, but let me just let just let's just throw something crazy out. Suppose the devil could release a virus that would scare everybody so bad that even pastors and churches would shut down and not go back for a year or a year and a half. And even when they did, they'd only do it virtually and no fellowship, no friendship. If the devil could do it, don't you think he would? Let that soak in on you here for just a second, all right? 
You say, why, why, what's going on that we're seeing? I know exactly what's going on. You say, you tell me a global worldwide pandemic just to try and mess with the church? Absolutely. Yeah absolutely that's what I'm telling you brother I'm talking about tonight if you're going to make it like you need to you don't need less of this you need more of this you don't need less of this you need more of this you need some spiritual groceries in the tank this evening and I love the hound out of this this evening brother James he didn't just feed him once he fed him twice why did he feed him twice because don't miss this because he knew the length and the load of the journey necessitated more intake. I got a, I got a 2015 Ram pickup truck sitting out there in the parking lot. You know what I found out about that thing? I found, it's got all kind of little neat features. I never had a vehicle that had that, and I can scroll through and see how many miles per gallon I'm getting right at the time when I'm getting it and all that kind of stuff. And if I'm, not, if I'm just driving up the road like I come up here the other day, I'm averaging about 19, a little over 19 miles to the gallon, which ain't too bad in that 5.7. Hear me, I didn't think. I'm averaging about 19 miles to the gallon. But you know what I found out? I found out when we went to youth camp this past year, and I was carrying and towing the trailer that had all them youngins luggage in that trailer. And when I say all them youngins luggage, I mean about 20, 25 boys and about the same amount of girls. Now I believe we could have got away real easy with the boys luggage, but brother, when all them girls come toting the kitchen sink, all them girls come toting everything they ever had in their entire blessed life and folded up in there, that trailer squatted just a little bit. Back into my truck, look like all them boys are doing now with their trucks, lowering it down in the rear end and going down the road. And I watched, I watched as my average miles per gallon with no load went from about 19 miles a gallon all the way down to about 11 miles to the gallon. You know what I ended up finding out, Brother Daniel? I found out because of the load I was carrying, I had to stop much more frequently and put something in my tank. When I wasn't carrying a load, I could keep going for a long ways without stopping as frequently. But when there is a load, the heaviness is behind me, the wind now is getting resistance against that trailer, I had to stop at least two more times extra for Phillips because I'm carrying a load. Y'all listen to me. In the day that we're living, so many Christians are carrying heavy loads. So many Christians are carrying heavy burdens. And the lie of the devil is, well, you're under a load. Don't go to church. You're under strain. Don't read your Bible. Just kick back and watch TV. That's a lie. When the load gets heavier, you need more groceries, not less groceries. You need more help, not less help. The reason so many Christians got no joy in their journey is they are empty this evening you want to know why so many Christians come to church and they leave and when they leave they say well I just ain't getting nothing and I just don't feel like I'm fed and this and that and the third you want to know why that is a lot of times the same way it was for me when I come to mama's table when I was a kid and I wasn't hungry little boys aren't always to be hungry there's only one reason when mama set meatloaf and set you know, hamburger, steak, and gravy out on the table. There's only one reason why I wasn't hungry when I was a kid. You want to know why it was? Because I had already snuck around and ate junk. And I was already full. You all know why some Christians don't get a lot out of this? Don't get a lot out of that book? Because they'd have been sticking their hands in the cookie jars of this world. And before they get here, they're already so tanked up on the sugar and the filth of this world. They already got a sugar high on all that stuff. And when you sling out some short of meat and potatoes and the gravy and the biscuits and get them the sop and syrup with it, they just ain't got no appetite for it. They don't want it. They want ice cream. They want cake. They want cotton candy. But that won't take you very far down the road. Uh, listen to me, just giving people a little bit of ice cream on Sunday and Sunday night and Wednesday night, that won't keep them going down the road. But thank God this evening we've got the meat of the Word of God that can put some meat on our bones uh, and some nourishment in our soul. And if you're hungry this evening, there's enough bread on God's table to go around this evening. Joy for the journey. Joy for the journey this evening comes from the comfort of a heavenly meal, knowing that your course is mapped out. I got I to close here. Can I say second or thirdly? Also, I'll tell you how to have joy for the journey. 
He had joy for the journey because he received a confrontational message. I'll tell you how to keep joy in your journey. When there's a confrontational message from the Word of God, don't get kicked, don't bucket, don't get mad. Receive it. Take it. Get right if it smacks you between the eyes. Watch the confrontational message. Look at what it said here. The Lord shows up to Elijah, verse number 9. Verse number 9. The Bible said, He came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, Watch the confrontational message. What doest thou here, Elijah? Y'all, God is not asking this question because he does not know the answer. Can I say God doesn't ask questions a lot of times to get answers? God asks questions to reveal to you the answer. He asked this question, What doest thou here, Elijah? Not like, I don't know why you're here. It's more like, you know you ain't supposed to be here. This is not where I want you to be. I got more planned for you than to hide out in a cave. I got work for you to do. I got somebody for you to help. And sitting in a cave and sucking your thumb is not it. Look at verse 13. Verse 13, he's going to do the same thing again. Verse 13, it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out, stood in the entering in of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said the second time, What doest thou here, Elijah? He is confronting him continually. You say, how long is he going to confront him? Till he gets right and gets out the cave. <laughs> See, how long will I have to keep hearing in my spirit that same confrontation on that same subject till you get right? I, I, we got some of the sweetest people in our church. I'm telling you, I love Bible Missionary Baptist Church. I, I really have enjoyed preaching to y'all. I do. This is as good a church as any. I love preaching to y'all, but I'm going to be honest with you. Ever since, ever since I got up here, and this is the way I am anywhere I go, I'm already looking forward to going home and preaching. I'm excited tomorrow night about preaching on the above average church to our people. Been sitting there working on it today, preaching Bible Institute at 530, preaching at 7. I love it. I love it. I think that's the way it ought to be. Anyways, and, and, and that, we got a little couple in our church. Man, God's done so much in their life. I mean, just, just absolutely, I just couldn't tell you everything he's done. Just saved them, uh, got him right, saved her. All their kids got saved. Two of their boys been called to preach. Just, man, just a blessing. Anyways, when they first come to us, preacher, she was lost. He is backslid, living together. Children from different marriages and things like that. Well, she got saved. He got right. Living together. Ain't joined a church or nothing? No, that wasn't going to be acceptable. Living together. And brother, I'd just get up and preach. And I didn't know nothing about this until here just a few months ago. They, they, we, I, I married them, then they joined the church, got everything right. You know what they told me? They said, Preacher, we can't tell you how happy we are that we finally got married and got right with God. I said, Why is that? He said, Because every service we came in, it didn't matter if you were preaching John 3, 16. Preacher, every service somewhere along the line, shacking up and living together and fornicating, it'd get hit. And I wasn't hitting it. You know, this is exactly what they told me. This is exactly what they told me, Brother Christian. They said, since we got married, they said, you must have stopped preaching on it. Because we ain't even heard it. I said, y'all, I wasn't shooting at you, and I ain't been preaching just for you. I preach the same exact stuff now I was preaching then. I said, here's the deal. Here's the difference. I'm still preaching the same stuff. You just ain't hearing it anymore because you're right. You know what I've always found out? When you pick a rock up and chuck it in a pack of dogs, it's only the one that gets hit that says, Oh, oh, oh. You know why some people get bowed up at preaching and get ticked off when certain preaching goes on? Because it hit them. You say, how long till it'll stop hitting me? Till you get right with the confrontational message. How does the message come, preacher? I love God. I, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I, you say, well, duh, preacher. No, I mean, I just love the way he works. Just love his personality and the way the Lord works. He's something else. 
say, how does the Lord work with his confrontational messages? Well, in chapter number 18, he worked like this. Said, all right, this is what we're going to do, chapter 18. There's only one God, and it can't be Baal and Jehovah at the same time. There's just one. So here's how we're going to find out with a confrontational message, who's God? Whoever's God answers by fire, that's the one that's God. All right? And them, them crazy yahoos jumped up and cut herself, you know, hopped around and shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing power and obey, 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 hear us. Ain't nothing happened. And old Elijah got up, prayed that little old simple prayer. Pow! God answered. His message was with fire. But did you notice chapter 19 where we're preaching out of? Elijah walks out of the cave when God's going to talk to him. And the Bible said, there come a fire. And God weren't in the fire. There come wind, God wasn't in the wind. You know what God was in in chapter 19? The Bible said it was a still, small voice. You know the problem with some people? They're not as balanced as God is. You see, there are certain people, even independent, fundamental, premillennial, King James Bible, believing Baptists, I, 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 I've been around all the flavors of them. You know what I found? There are some that says, well, if the fire ain't coming down and we ain't hooping and a hollering and a shouting and a screaming and a spitting and a sweating, then God ain't in it. That's the only way God can move. And then there's another side of them that says, well, all that hooping and a hollering and a shouting and screaming and spitting ain't of God. We need to be reverent and quiet and dead and holy. And, and that's the only way God can move. But you know what I found out? In chapter 18, God's in the fire. In chapter 19, He's not. You can't stick God in your little box. You say, what should I be looking for when I come to the house of God? Just look for Him however He moves. One service, he'll sweep in in the fire and blow the place out and the doors come off. We come unscrewed and hoop and holler and shout and cry. And another service, we come in and it just settles in nice and easy and quiet. We drop to our knees and bow our face and there ain't so much as a holy grunt, but I found out God's in the both of them. I found out it doesn't matter to me whether he's in fire or whether he's in the still small voice. I just want him to confront me with something so I may get closer to him tonight. I wonder, are you willing to be confronted? See, we're living in a day nobody likes to be confronted. Don't like confrontational preaching. But there ain't no such thing as non-confrontational preaching. There is no such thing. You say, well, I know some preachers that they're never confrontational. They're not preaching. You say, how do you know that? It's somewhere there's got to be a little confrontation. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible said this is preaching the Word. Preaching the Word is this. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. That's what preaching is. It's got to have a little element of all three. It can't just be all beating you over the head and reproving and rebuking. There's got to be some exhorting. But it can't just always be exhorting. Got to be some reproving and rebuking too. Oh, it ain't preaching. I don't know what you come looking and listening for, but if you want some real joy in the journey, if you want some real joy in the journey, keep yourself in a place where you say, God, I need you to confront me. God, I'm not happy being average and normal and substandard. Lord, I'm not happy just living in sin and living in my lukewarmness. God, I want to be confronted. You keep an attitude like that, you keep some joy in the journey. You keep some joy in the journey. I, I'm done. Confrontational message. Comfort of a heavenly meal. Of course, it was mapped out. He had commitment to the ministry. Ain't got time to deal with that. Lastly, here we go. The last thing that I find that gave him joy for the journey was the conveying of the mantle. It was the conveying of a mantle. Watch, watch come all the way down to verse number 19. Verse 19. Uh, this, this is where we get to in verse 19. Chapter 19, verse 19. So he departed thence. He's going to get out the cave. He's going to get out the wilderness. Here's the journey God's got him on. He departed thence and found Elisha. It was no mistake that he found Elisha. God told him where to go back up in verse number 16. Did you notice in verse 16, this is interesting, the Bible said that God told him, God told him when he come out of the wilderness, well, verse 15, he, he's told him to come, go out of the wilderness, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. Verse 16, anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha to be the prophet in thy room, to be the preacher. He told him three people to anoint. Anoint a king over here, anoint a king over there, and then go anoint the preacher. 
Do you see the first thing on God's radar screen that he went and anointed? You see what was most important to God? It was not kings. It was somebody that preached the word of God. If it was me and God said, hey, I want you to run down there and elect a new president of the United States and I want you to run up to Canada and I want you to elect a new president and a new prime minister of Canada and then go on down there to Podunk somewhere beside the road and say that guy's the new pastor of that church. You know what I'd have probably done? I'd have went to the president here first, prime minister there, and then I'd went down there. That's not God's order. God said paramount is the preaching of the word of God. You go do that first. Catch them next. Anyways, watch what he said. Verse 19, she departed thence, found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plying with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father, my mother, and then I'll follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen, and slew them, boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, gave unto the people they did eat. Then he arose, went after Elijah, and ministered unto him. You know the last thing that will give you joy for your journey? Elijah found this out. What was sucking the joy out of Elijah's journey at the beginning of chapter 19 is his focus and his eyes was all on himself. They're after me. I'm all alone. I'm no better than my father's. It's, it's all about me, me, me. You know what will make you a miserable Christian? When it's all about you. There ain't no more miserable Christians than Christians that are solely focused on themselves. See what starts giving him joy for the journey? He gets his eyes off of him. And he starts looking for somebody to be a minister to. Lord, I'm going to get out of this wilderness by finding somebody else that I can be a blessing to. You know what you'll find out? If you'll get your eyes off of you for just a second, sister, just a second, brother, you might find out there's people out there that really need some help. You know what you might find out? There's people that's actually got it worse than you got it. And what happens when you start investing in somebody else? You don't have time to invest in your little pity party where you sit at with your lip pooched out. And isn't this awesome? I love this. I, I absolutely love this. Elijah thinks that his sole goal, why God sent him down there, was to minister to Elisha. Isn't that what he thinks? He says, go on down there and anoint him. Go anoint him. That's my, that's my purpose, to minister to this boy. But you know what you find out when you start ministering to somebody else? Watch what God does. Can I borrow your Bible just a minute? I don't want to have to walk up back behind the pulpit again. Look at verse number 21. Look at the last part of verse 21. He goes to minister to Elisha. And watch what happens when he goes to minister. The one he's ministering unto turns around and starts ministering to him. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Elijah comes by and says, Well, God sent me down here just to be a blessing to you, so that's what I'm going to do. And the longer he starts being a blessing to him, the more he starts being a blessing to him. You know what I found out? I've, you, for, for years I used to preach in the nursing home. That's where I got my start at. I got, I, I got my start and cut my teeth preaching in prisons and jails and street corners, assisted livings, nursing homes, and children's church to little kids. I didn't start out preaching here. Nobody does. But, brother, if there's one reason why I'm a little bit raw sometimes, you think I'm raw now, you should have caught me when I was 17 or 18, 19 years old. Nothing but preaching on the street and preaching to convicts and little kids and a bunch of little devils sitting there, amen, and, 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 and preaching to people that just look at you and you think they ain't even listening to nothing you got to say. And I, I'll never forget going in those places and the whole time going into them, Preacher Foster, I know some of y'all have been there, I thought to myself... I am going to minister to them. That's all this excursion is. It is simply giving of myself and ministry. Look at me, God. I'm really doing something. You said, you know, as much as you've done unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me. You know, I was sick and you visited me and I was this and I was that. And God, I'm, I'm doing it, Lord. Here I am. But it's just solely ministry for me to them. But I never, I never, I never went to one of them places. But what after I got in there? some little old sweet, white-headed saint of God that still had most of all their mental faculties and they'd just been stuck there, turned around and was a minister unto me. 
And I walked out of that place shouting the victory. I'd always walk out of there shouting the victory and say, Thank God I ain't got no problems. God's been good to me. And if that little old saint of God can sit in there while I preach and sing to them and lift the little old bony hand and, and while it's shaking and praise God and give God glory, then there ain't nothing I can't praise God for. I'd always leave saying what a blessing it is that somebody was a minister to me after I tried to be a minister to them. You know what will give you joy for the journey? Tonight, tonight. I'm going to tell you how to get some joy for the journey. Tonight, go looking for somebody to help. Because invariably, every time you start helping them, God will turn them around and let them help you. I thought to myself, I did. I, I, I thought to myself that when God sent me to North Carolina, I really did. Brother Daniel, I thought when God sent me to Bible Missionary Baptist Church in North Carolina to a little church that had been hurting and, and, and just, you know, went... And, Went, was just tore up from the floor up, you know, and, and hurt by things that happened in the past. I thought when God sent me up there and pulled me off the road as far as full-time evangelism, I really thought it was just, it was an Elijah thing. It's all right, you go down there and be a minister to them. I thought it was just total ministry from me to them. I thought, all right, whatever, God, that's your business. I'm just going down there to be a minister. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea that there was areas of my soul that needed ministering unto. There were areas of my family's life that needed reached and touched and ministered unto that I couldn't get in any other way than being there. And after being there now for a little, little three and a half years, I have found out I don't think I've been near as big a minister to them as they have been unto me. I'm telling you, tomorrow night, some of these young fellas, whew, some of these young fellas, I'm going to get to try and teach the Bible too tomorrow night. They have no idea. They have no idea what a blessing it is to see some young men in this age, teenage young men, that are so plugged into Jesus, that's all they want. That are so hungry for the Bible that they love their pastor and they love that King James Bible and they want to preach and they go street preaching with us. I have no idea that I needed that. Say, how'd you get that? I got it when I went to help somebody else. And anytime you help somebody else, God will always turn it around and let them help you. But as long as you got your eyes on your stinking self, you're going to miss the blessing of the ministry. The ministry ain't about you. It's about somebody else tonight. Child of God, I'm through. I'm through. Child of God, it is not time to pooch our lip out. It ain't time to be worried about who's in the White House. It ain't time to be scared to death of COVID killing all of us. It's time to kick the blessed God thing into overdrive. Put the pedal to the floor. Look up our redemption draw at night. Put a smile on our face. Put a song in our heart. And enjoy the journey. Too many miles behind me. Too many trials are through. Too many tears help me to remember. I've got too much to gain to lose. Now I've crossed through the hot burning desert. I struggled the right road to choose. But somewhere up ahead, there's cool, clear water. And defeat is one word I'll never use. Y'all know this song? Stand up and sing with me. You know it good enough. Too many sunsets lie behind the mountain. Too many rivers my feet have walked through. Too many treasures waiting over yonder. And I've got too much to gain to lose. Place up for us, my brother. We don't come too far to look back now. Too much to gain to lose now. Let's just have some joy in the journey. Say, my journey has been tough, preacher. I'm not saying your journey ain't been tough. I'm not, I'm not minimizing the pain in your journey. 
What I am maximizing is the fact that God knows where you are. I'm not minimizing your pain. I'm trying to maximize the fact that the Lord is not surprised by where you're at. And if you'll let Him, He'll give you some joy tonight in the journey. He don't want you to walk around miserable, upset, aggravated, ticked off. The Christian in the New Testament that suffered more than anybody in the New Testament said these words, Rejoice evermore. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. If He can do it, I can too. The joy of the Lord is your strength tonight. Through the Spirit's joy, I believe we can have some. Do you got it? Say, preacher, I'll be honest, I've lost some joy in my journey. Tonight, won't you find your place around the altar? Say, Lord, help me to rest in the fact you know where I'm at and what's going on. Help me to start feasting on the things of God. Maybe you've been confronted tonight. Get it right. Start looking for somebody to be a blessing to. Get the joy back in your journey. Let's all stand this evening. Preacher, it's yours. Father, I pray you'd bless the simple message from your word. Help your people with it. We love the Emmanuel Baptist Church here in Florence, Kentucky, and we thank you for them. I want you to bless them in a mighty big way. I wish you would. I wish you'd help them. Help your people tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.